Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Louise Chaquette, and I'm the bilingual health promotion consultant for the Best Start Resource Center of Health Nexus. I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on the new healthy growth and development standards alignment with Best Start prenatal education messages. Now, I really want to emphasize that this webinar will be more relevant to prenatal educators who work in public health in Ontario, and that was indicated in the registration. And out of curiosity, yeah. I, you, everyone is welcome, of course, and you will find something interesting, but it, uh, it would be good for the presenter to have a sense of who, who is in the, the audience. So if you could uh, click on the sector that best <coughs> represents your workplace, that would be great. Well, uh, and then we'll get started right after that. So it's certainly predominantly public health participants that are here, which is great. And I know some more will be signing in very shortly also. Um, and the presenter has indicated that there is construction going on in our building, so it might be a little bit more difficult at times if you hear background noise. That is the reason. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous people who've been living and working on the lands across Canada for thousands of years, including the land from where you're watching this webinar today. The Health Nexus office in Toronto is located on the historical territory of the Wendat, Pitun, Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations. We're grateful to have the opportunity to work in this territory. Okay. And at this point, I would like to introduce the speaker, who is Dr. Sarah Carsley. She's the Applied Public Health Science Specialist in Healthy Growth and Development in the Department of Health Promotion, Chronic Disease and Injury Prevention at Public Health Ontario. Dr. Carsley completed a Master's of Science in Epidemiology at McGill University and a PhD in Health Science Research at the University of Toronto. She's also previously worked on the Rourke Baby Record and the Greek Health Record Evidence Updates and as a Clinical Research Project Manager on the Target Kids Study at SickKids Hospital. Her research interests include childhood obesity surveillance, preconception health, early child development, health sciences, electronic medical records, and preventative medicine. And at this point, I would like to um, give the microphone to Dr. Carsley. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise, and thanks for that great introduction. Um, welcome everyone who's joining us online today, and thanks to Best Start for inviting me to do this webinar. Uh, today, the webinar title is The New Healthy Growth and Development Standards, Alignment with Best Start's Prenatal Education Key Messages. Over the next uh, 40, 45 minutes, I'll go through a bit of an introdu introduction on the maternal and reproductive health of uh, women and individuals in Ontario. I'm going to talk about the background on the new modernized standards. Then I will get into the prenatal education key messages with a focus on the topics of consideration that are in the Healthy Growth and Development Guideline. Throughout that, uh, pre that piece of the presentation, I'm going to be interspersing evidence to support the public health interventions that are aligned with the prenatal education key messages, followed by uh, a brief summary, and then we'll take questions. I also wanted to say throughout this uh, webinar, if I re refer to the best start prenatal education key messages, I might also be just referring to them as key messages. So. Just to begin, I know that for the people online that this, this is not new, but I like to ground myself in understanding why reproductive health is a significant public health issue. And really, it's about good health before pregnancy contributing to a healthy pregnancy, a healthy pregnancy contributing to healthy birth outcomes, and healthy birth outcomes along with the preparation for parenthood to contribute to healthy children and families along the life course. This is really an upstream approach. We seek to address the causes of the causes, and this investing in reproductive health is an upstream investment. Um, I'm an epidemiologist, as Louise mentioned, so I always like to begin with some numbers and some idea of what the state of reproductive and maternal health is across the province. So this is also a, a shameless self-plug for Public Health Ontario, who has this wonderful resource of our snapshots that's available on our website, and I've listed the um, URL at the bottom of this slide. But they do a great job of collecting relevant 
maternal um, reproductive health and child health indicators that are available and producing them in an interactive uh, graphic on the website. So substance use during pregnancy, a really important uh, measurement to understand risk factors, uh, are wide ranging across the province. So in bold, I've listed the Ontario prevalence of smoking, alcohol use, drug use, and alcohol or drug use. But I'd like you to note that the range is actually the lowest to highest prevalences that occur per health unit. So for example, although the uh, Ontario rate of smoking is 7.4%, it can be 2.1% or it can be 22.2% depending on where you live. And as we know, these risk factors do produce uh, negative birth and health outcomes for women and children. Uh, alcohol use that is currently at 2.5 percent as of 2016, drug use 2.2, and alcohol or drug use at 4.3 percent. If we look at maternal mental health, uh, anxiety prevalence across the province is 10.3 percent, although it ranges all the way up to 24 percent depending on where you live. Uh, depression is at 8.2 percent. History of postpartum depression for those women who have already had a baby is 4%, and any reported mental health concern is 17%. So going all the way up to 36.7, these prevalence uh, ranges are quite high. If we look at maternal physical health, uh, one of our only indicators of preconception health is folic acid use prior to pregnancy, and that is 33.5% across Ontario going up to as high as 50.4%. That is well below the targeted um, prevalence of having 100% folic acid use prior to pregnancy. Similarly, if we look at folic acid use prior to or during pregnancy, it's only at 31.3%. Um, gestational weight gain is another indicator that we're able to uh, collect. And this is actually particularly interesting to me is in my past life, uh, I've been a, a specific researcher on childhood obesity, and we know that women who gain more weight than recommended during pregnancy have a higher likelihood of having a baby and infant who has childhood obesity. So the provincial prevalence is 45.3%, with a range between 31 to 54.4%. And what that says to me is that this is a pretty ubiquitous problem across, uh, across Ontario. Finally, in our reproductive health indicators for 2016, preterm delivery is about 8.1 per 100 live births, small and large for gestational age coming in around 10 per 100, and low birth weight is about 7 per 100. High birth weight is just under 2 per 100. So these are all the health outcomes and health indicators that are collected routinely. So I'm now going to move on to discuss the new Ontario Public Health Standards. And just to preemptively give a little bit of warning, these are, um, I'm going to start by talking about the standards themselves, and then I'm going to move into specifically the new healthy growth and development standard and guidelines. A lot of the uh, information I'm presenting on these slides are taken directly from the documents. So I, the wording that the ministry has produced is very specific, so I've really tried not to change anything, and directly, I might be directly reading the specific directives. So where do we come from and where do we go? So the OPHS orig from 2008 what, uh, is moved, has moved to protecting the, and promoting the health of Ontarians. The Ontario Public Health Standards requirements for program services and accountability, and these came into effect as of January 2018, and they were revised July 1st. Um, to begin, when you look at the policy document, it starts with the, a uh, policy and legislative context to really ground the standards in a pop population health approach. So this is figure one of the standards, and it focuses on upstream efforts to promote health and prevent diseases, to improve the health of populations, and the differences in health among and between groups. Um, really, that also makes in reference to health equity. Health risks and priorities change as people grow in age, and public health works to address the health across a life course. And as you can see in this figure, the population health approach involves four parts of this uh, pie, social determinants of health, healthy, healthy behaviors, healthy communities, 
and population health assessment. And this really just shows that public health works through multiple channels. And at the outer ring of the circle are all the life course stages of which uh, to demonstrate our commitment to addressing these factors across the life course. The 2018 modernized OPHS is really built on public health frameworks with a focus on policy, a coordinated approach, and transparency. I've shown figure two, the policy framework for public health programs and services in this graphic, but I won't go into all the details. Um, I really encourage those of you interested to uh, find this document online, and if you're interested in, in the language that's used to describe these standards, you can look at the principles, programs, and services, objectives, and uh, domains that they uh, have in this, doc in this figure. What I did want to point out specifically was the population health impact pyramid. Uh, as some of you on the slide might know, I have been doing a situational assessment of the current state of healthy growth and development across the province as a part of some of my work um, as the new asset of Public Health Ontario. And one of the themes that came out was really this shift from individual to population level interventions that the new standards are really promoting. So focusing on interventions that address supportive environments and social determinants is likely to have greater population impact versus relying solely on individual level interventions. And that's really increasing population impact by focusing lower on this uh, pyramid um, rather than the individual, uh, increasing the individual effort needed in the top two uh, triangles. Uh, I think I have a cursor here. Yes, it's not um, lost on me that the work that we do in healthy growth and development and rep specifically reproductive and child health really exists in the top two triangles, counseling, event, counseling and education and clinical interventions. So moving forward into a more population level uh, intervention um, approach will be challenging in our work with the evidence that currently exists on some of the interventions that are available. So moving on to the healthy growth and development guidelines, there's protocols and guidelines are program and topic specific documents which provide direction on how boards of health shall, shall operationalize or approach specific requirements. And in 2008, the Family Health Program Standards involved two program standards and two guidance documents. There was the Reproductive Health Guidance Document as well as a Child Health Document. I apologize if you can hear this construction in the background. Our building here at PHO has been under construction, which seems like an endless amount of time. Anyway, continuing on, the, this program standard for reproductive health and child health had five protocols that were under the umbrella of family health. What's changed in the 2008 version is that these two program standards have come together under one healthy growth and development standard and guideline. Um, this involves two protocols, the Healthy Babies, Healthy Children program and child visual health and vision screening. There are three requirements to the standards, eight program outcomes, and 11 topics of consideration. <clears throat> and I'll go through what these are all separately, but again, um, I encourage everyone to read this document if they want more precise information about the language. So the Healthy Growth and Development Standard of the OPHS has a stated goal to achieve optimal preconception, pregnancy, newborn, child, and youth parental and family health. And this is figure one from the guideline which shows these life stages and how the topics for consideration under healthy growth and development relate. The 2018 modernized standards have eight program outcomes, uh, as I mentioned, and really they wanted to make these standards more focused on outcomes. I'm not going to read all eight of these uh, program outcomes but really it's about having the knowledge and the ability to um, produce good impacts for the, popula for the population. Um, the three requirements I've listed here, which are in the standard, I highlighted requirement two because this is really where I think the meat of how the prenatal education got, uh, key messages will relate to the, and align with the guidelines. But the Board of Health shall develop and implement a program of public health interventions using a comprehensive health promotion approach to support healthy growth and development 
in the health unit population. Uh, every time I read that, I, I kind of take a, a breath and say, okay, easier said than done. But this is what we are working towards achieving. Um, if we unpack requirement two in the standard, it really shows that the program of public health intervention, oh my God, I, I apologize so much. I hope that does not happen again. Um, the program of public health interventions shall be informed by an assessment of risk and protective factors that influence healthy growth and development, as well as an assessment of existing programs and services within the area of jurisdiction of the Board of Health to build on community assets and minimize duplication. So building off existing opportunities, and I think that's a really um, important point, that leads me to collaboration with stakeholders. So the consultation and, co and collaboration with local stakeholders in the health education apologies, uh, non-governmental, social, and other relevant sectors has specific attention to these five community partners. I really wanted to specify that healthcare providers and LINs are a very important part of uh, the healthy growth and development guideline and especially in reproductive health because we do work strongly with our partners in hospitals and primary care. And so this is especially pertinent, I think, for our content area. And finally, here are the topics of consideration that I will be focusing on to describe how they are aligned with the best start uh, key messages. So this is a slide that shows the difference in how they've changed since 2008. As I mentioned, there was two program standards, the Reproductive Health and the Child Health Standards, and now they've merged into Healthy Growth and Development. Um, I always think about the Spice Girls song, When Two Become One, whenever I think about this, uh, this change. I don't know if there are any Spice Girls uh, fans out there. But the three top ones in reproductive health have not changed, and they still occur in the healthy growth and development. There are new topics of consideration that I have shown with a new um, indicator next to, their, um, next to the topic. Healthy sexuality, um, in fact, is not necessarily new, but it has moved underneath this new standard. Um, mental health promotion is new, but I will speak to that a bit later. There is an entire guideline dedicated to the mental health to mental health that accompanies all the program standards. Uh, pregnancy counseling is a new topic of consideration as well as visual health. These two uh, child health topics for consideration, healthy family dynamics and healthy eating, healthy weights, and physical activity, no longer occur as specific topics under the new standards. However, they are not forgotten. They are still an important part of the public health work that we do. And I think when I move on and, and explain topic overviews in a minute, um, those will occur under growth and development. So how do the prenatal key messages align with the new OPHS? As many of you on the line are uh, likely aware, the Best Start Prenatal Education Key Messages can be found at ontarioprenatalleducation.ca, and this is an amazing resource for a one-stop shop, of a stop shop of understanding all of the different um, ed all the different topics that are involved in prenatal education. And this is just the bottom of that same web page that shows the 25 different topics that have been extremely well researched and um, supported by many resource documents. And I'm going to go through how the new standards and the topics of consideration uh, overlay on top of these uh, key messages. So as I mentioned, here are the topics of consideration. And at first glance, as I was preparing this talk, I just picked out the ones that seemed so immediately to fall uh, on top of the file folders in that graphic. And you can see that in this slide right here. So health before pregnancy um, aligns very well with preconception health. Routine prenatal care, healthy eating and weight gain, active living, alcohol smoking, medications and drugs, safety during pregnancy and abuse all really fall under the umbrella of healthy pregnancies. As you would suspect, mental health aligns really well with the mental health promotion topic. Newborn care, newborn safety, and transition to parenthood will likely fall under preparation for parenting. 
and then breastfeeding was probably the easiest, easiest one to align because we have a breastfeeding topic of consideration. So I'm just going to briefly describe topic overviews or uh, resource documents that were developed uh, in 2019, so this year. These uh, resource documents were really made to support the topics of consideration in the OPHS. Now these are still uh, in development. PHO has taken a very active role in working with the ministry to produce these documents. They are meant to be rapid review uh, reviews of current literature on the public health interventions focusing on review level evidence. That means that because these topics were so big, we would not have time to look at all the possible literature, so we focused on those um, systematic review and meta-analysis of interventions um, and not the primary literature to reduce the amount of uh, work that our staff at PHO would have to do in order to get through some of these massive topics. We really worked with the field on relevant content to be included. So there were working groups that were struck in the development of the Healthy Growth and Development Guideline that we were able to extend their um, volunteer, their volunteer on the working group into helping us form some of these documents. And it really, they're meant to describe public health interventions at multiple levels. So public education and awareness, supportive environments, collaboration and partnership, and direct services. These documents also go through the current state of trends in various um, aspects of each topic of consideration. They go through risk and protective factors, as well as giving additional resources. They're meant to be dynamic documents so updated as new evidence emerges. And we are currently working with the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care on the next steps and getting these documents available to the uh, public health units and to the public. So I'm going to go through each of the prenatal uh, messages that aligns well with the uh, new OPHS. So to start, health before pregnancy, as I mentioned, is aligned with preconception health. And within the key messages, they had four. Make a reproductive life plan, live a healthy lifestyle and protect your fertility, see your healthcare provider if you're planning to have a baby in the next few years, space your pregnancies and learn from your past pregnancies. Again, when you, in, when you go into each of these folders, they have four tabs that show messages, references and other resources on the Best Start website and it is an excellent source of information. The preconception health um, bit that we, we have in the Healthy Growth and Development Guideline really talks about preconception, whether before a first or subsequent pregnancy, is an opportune period to improve the health of women and all individuals to prevent adverse maternal and infant outcomes. Risk factors that may occur during preconception period include chronic conditions such as obesity, hypertension, and diabetes as well as risk, high-risk behaviors, alcohol intake, smoking, and substance use. These risk factors are associated with adverse outcomes, such as low birth weight, birth defects, or other complications, and infant mortality. Preconception care aims to promote the health of individuals of reproductive age before, con before conception and thereby improve pregnancy-related outcomes, reflecting back on um, the key message of seeing a healthcare provider if you're planning on having a baby. So what is the evidence for preconception public health intervention? Our teams looked at folic acid supplementation, which we found two studies that showed public awareness campaigns um, and individual counseling and provision were some of the strategies to promote folic acid supplementation. There were three reviews that looked at electronic or e-health-based interventions. Partnership with primary care, other health care providers, workplaces and schools were two other studies that we examined. Counseling to reduce risk and promote healthy behaviors. There's the reproductive life plan, which was also echoed in the key message. And finally, counseling for STIs or sexually transmitted infections. I have listed all the references that we uh, were able to find for each of these interventions. And at the end of this presentation, there is a full list, a full citation for those interested in reading more uh, in depth about each one of these interventions. Uh, Louise had the, saw me present last week at another talk, and I told 
for then that I might add this in every single talk I give, but while we were doing the rapid review for this topic of consideration, I specifically asked one of our research assistants to look for preconception care interventions that included men or that included members of the LGBTQ2 community. And although best practice recommendations such as Best Start and such as the Ontario Public Health Association shift document includes these populations as important, um, important populations not to forget, there was no published evidence that for either of these um, populations that included interventions, uh, that included them in their interventions when they were being tested. I always want to just bring awareness to this that if public health units are doing um, preconception health programming and interventions that they include these two populations and not just women and that if they are doing some very interesting and innovative um, work that you evaluate it and tell us how it goes because there is really a dearth of evidence of these of, uh, interventions to reflect these two important populations in preconception care. So moving on to routine prenatal care, um, again there was four uh, key messages. A checkup before conceiving will help you prepare for pregnancy. Early and regular prenatal care will help you have a healthy pregnancy and baby. Prenatal care is delivered by different healthcare providers including obstetricians, family doctors, registered midwives and nurse practitioners. Routine prenatal care visits with your healthcare provider will help monitor your health and the health of your baby. And finally, prenatal education programs are an important part of your care and support during pregnancy. So I wanted to show this graphic because in the topic for consideration, healthy pregnancies is really an umbrella and encompasses multiple of the key messages that the Best Start, um, key, uh, Best Start has described on their website. So risk factors such as alcohol intake, smoking, poor nutrition in pregnancy can all lead to negative outcomes in the physical growth and cognitive development of the child. Uh, and in addition to prenatal care, interventions to improve modifiable, modifiable risk and protective factors can better the health of the mother, fam, the mother, the child, families, and society overall, going back to that life course approach. Um, I wanted to point out that the topics of consideration in the Healthy Growth and Development Guidelines do not focus less on clinical aspects of childbirth compared to the key messages. And I'll talk about that a bit later. So if you see on this, uh, I've circled all of these different pieces of key messages that we do touch on and that do fall under the Healthy Growth and Development Standards. What I was mentioning before about the clinical aspects, these um, file folders right in the middle that really focus on labor and delivery are not included in the OPHS. Um, and so Best Start really does provide a great source if you need information on these uh, topics. Prenatal education doing, during routine care. Um, in our topic overview, we really felt that public health has a role to collaborate and partner with all healthcare providers that see individuals who are pregnant. Uh, and this can occur in one-on-one -on -one or in group settings, and I'll, I'll get to modes of delivery in the next slide. But we did make a concerted effort to include um, a statement on informed decision making in pregnancy and birth. Um, we do feel public health does have a role to support uh, informed decision making. And we looked at one review that demonstrated the positive effect of decision aids, such as booklets with audio guides or interactive computer programs, on decision making by decreasing decisional conflict and anxiety and increasing knowledge. Uh, we looked at prenatal education that could occur in other settings. And so, you know, uh, we realized that there are different forms of delivery and public health really has a huge role in delivering some of these prenatal educations, whether it be through group prenatal education programs in person or online programs, which I know are, are two forms of delivery that are currently ongoing. But it's important, uh, prenatal education is important to give all individuals and their families uh, the ability to, and the opportunities to prepare for pregnancy, labor and birth, and care of the newborn as well as adjustment to family life. 
Um, and from the, from the evidence and from the research, it's been associated with higher levels of satisfaction with the birth experience as well as the promotion of health behaviors, including exercise and nutrition. Um, I've listed all of the forms of delivery that we looked into in our rapid review, as well as the um, reference. And again, at the end of the presentation, there's the full citation if you want to look at the, uh, the reviews more closely. Um, this was the um, topic of another talk that I gave last week, which was, what is the evidence on mHealth or eHealth interventions for prenatal education? As we're living in a more technologically advanced world where everyone has a computer in their pocket, um, it seems that the, it's a very attractive medium for public health to reach a large number of people, as the uptake of smartphone use is quite ubiquitous across the population. So it came up in a lot of our rapid reviews in multiple topics, but especially for prenatal education and the use of apps, it is seemed to be a growing body of evidence to support the use in public health. So one systematic review looked at studies of e-health interventions that were targeted to women who were overweight or obese, and they found positive effects on limiting gestational weight gain, promoting postnatal weight loss, and moderate to, physical, moderate to vigorous physical activity, and decreased caloric intake. However, there was no effect on any obstetric or natal outcomes. So although the health behavior seemed to improve, there was, it was unclear about the health effects on the baby. Uh, another study used text messages or SMS technology to promote maternal and infant health. Again, there was modest uh, effects found on behavioral changes on selected or preventative behaviors, such as smoking cessation, diabetes control, and vaccine uptake. These are the uh, key messages related to healthy eating and weight gain, as well as active living. I'm not going to read through all of them, but I, I'm sure most people online are well aware of what um, they will promote. But I did want to make a note that these two align with multiple guidelines under the OPHS. So the Chronic Disease Prevention Guideline has topics of consideration that affect healthy eating, weight gain, uh, physical activity, so active living, and, and sedentary behavior, and sleep. And there are topic overviews that were produced for each one of these topics as well. Um, how much they describe the pregnancy, uh, healthy eating and waking during pregnancy, um, I am less familiar as I was not involved in those creations. But for the general population, it's good to know that these resources also exist. If you can't find what you're looking for under healthy pregnancies, you might be able to find something under the healthy eating topic overview, for example. Similarly, uh, substance use prevention and harm reduction guideline has topics of consideration, and alcohol, smoking, medications, and drugs would fall under that guideline. Uh, the key messages related to safety during pregnancy and abuse um, are less focused on under the topics of consideration. However, in our proposed topic overview documents, we have addressed these issues as risk factors. So I've just um, demonstrated a small graphic of one of the tables that is, will hopefully be in the overview. And it goes through risk factors and protective factors at the individual, biological, behavioral, relationship, and environmental um, settings. So environmental risks such as maternal secondhand smoke, uh, air pollution, lead pesticides, and hazardous waste are things that we want to flag, as well as relationship status. And of course, intimate partner violence is a huge risk factor for having a healthy pregnancy. So moving on to the mental health key messages, um, there was four that I can list here, that were listed here. How, how you feel mentally, serve your mental health before, during, and after pregnancy. Some people experience anxiety and or depression during pregnancy. Baby blues are common in the first two weeks after giving birth. And ask for help if you have symptoms of anxiety and or depression. Um, the mental health promotion guideline is, uh, was added this year from the OPHS as a separate guideline to accompany all the program standards. Um, that is another document that you can uh, 
used to support the OPHS. Um, but I wanted to make a specific plug for this perinatal mental health toolkit from the Healthy Human Development Table that was just released last week and is available on the Public Health Ontario website. I think because the mental health promotion guideline exists independently of having a, uh, as well as uh, having a topic of consideration under the guideline, there might be some, it might have gotten lost in the, the amount of, how should I say, the amount of information that I think is important on this topic may not be accurately or not be captured well enough under either the mental health promotion guideline that encompasses all populations, so it does not focus on pregnancy, and in the healthy pregnancies um, and healthy growth and development guideline may not be uh, captured as much as we would like it to be. And I think that this perinatal mental health toolkit really fills that gap, or my perceived gap, I guess I should say. And there are five modules, which is really an overview of how the Healthy Human Development Table was uh, brought together and their methods to develop the toolkit. Uh, the importance of perinatal mental health is described in module two. And it goes through planning, population health promotion strategies, and individual care surrounding perinatal mental health in modules three to five. This is really supposed to be an interactive uh, website, and I encourage everyone to uh, check it out on our website for more information around perinatal mental health. Um, getting towards the end, the breastfeeding key messages are listed on this slide. I'm not going to read through all of them because I think um, the listeners online today are well acquainted with the importance of breastfeeding. But I did want to note that the first one is that breastfeeding is normal, is a normal, unequaled way to feed your baby. Babies need just your milk for the first six months, refer referencing exclusive breastfeeding. And breastfeeding up to uh, two years or longer is healthy for babies and is encouraged. The breastfeeding from the Healthy Growth and Development Guideline starts the same way. So it's the optimal source of nutrition to support healthy growth and cognitive development of infants. And we go through a bit more of the benefits uh, of breastfeeding. And then the initiation rates have increased over time. But as I think we all know, the rates for exclusive breastfeeding and breastfeeding duration are still quite low across the province. So the breastfeeding topic overview is actually one of those massive um, lit searches that we did where there really is a huge amount of literature on public health interventions to support breastfeeding. So I've just indicated a few highlights that I um, wanted to share. Uh, education and under education and support during clinical care, providing breastfeeding support through trained professionals during antenatal and postnatal care can help increase duration and exclusivity of breastfeeding. Um, we found one study that showed the higher improvements in breastfeeding rates were seen when interventions were delivered in a combination of settings. And that goes again to the importance of us having good relationships and partnerships with our healthcare providers in the community. Partner and family support during breastfeeding education interventions can be helpful in influencing breastfeeding outcomes. And I just wanted to highlight that there is a randomized controlled trial occurring at the moment led by Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer Abastic that is recruiting um, expectant parents to provide a co-parenting breastfeeding support intervention, and I think it's an online resource. And so if you have any, other que if you have any questions about you can contact uh, Dr. Abastic or myself and I can provide you some information, but I think it's a, a great opportunity to test some of these interventions um, with public health. And finally, Lau et al. provided support for e-technologies, again, uh, adopting our, our smartphone use, such as web-based and text messaging uh, interventions for promoting and supporting breastfeeding. So again, this is an emerging area of uh, interest. I'm going to really talk very briefly on newborn care and newborn safety. Uh, newborn care was captured briefly in the topic of consideration under preparation for parenting. However, we included that in the healthy pregnancies topic overview. Um, I think that the Best Start prenatal education key messages has a lot more of a clinical focus, which we do not get into um, from the guidelines. 
And the newborn safety information, such as safe infant sleep, uh, safe environments, and injury prevention, such as drowning, prevention of scalds, scalds and burns, prevention of falls, um, are actually captured more under the topic overview of growth and development. So finally, transition to parenthood. Um, the best start key messages here, the birth of a baby brings joy and challenges to the lives of parents. Um, I'm not going to read all of them, but I really wanted to stress that the focus is on the emotional connection and the transition that being uh, partnered with, uh, having a partner in your relationship can change after a baby is born. And uh, this may be especially true if it's your first baby. And the importance of self-care and taking time to take care of yourself so that you're best able to take care of your baby is an excellent message that I hope that we echo in the par preparation for parenting from the guideline, um, which we do, as the first bullet point says, preparation for parenting is a significant stage that influences parents, caregivers, as they transition from being partners to parents. But we also include ranges of activities such as gathering supplies needed for the, for the baby, information related to infant care, that goes along with the newborn care piece, uh, feeding and immunizations, pregnancy and parental leave um, or benefits. And we show that these have a significant impact on the parent-infant relationship, infant development, as well as the relationship between partners and caregivers. And I just wanted to um, say that I'm, I'm, pretty ha I'm very happy that Bestar has chosen the wording of transition to parenthood as their key message, key message because I think especially in healthy growth and development from preconception to pregnancy to having a newborn infant toddler and then a preschooler and then into school health, that very short period in the scheme of things is full of transitions. And I think in public health we don't um, take care enough to look at this, these specific periods as kind of critical times where we can help support families and parents in their um, in keeping their families healthy and keeping their babies growing properly. So I was very happy to see that wording, and um, I hope that the preparation for parenting piece also reflects the importance of that uh, time period. So we did look at what evidence there is to support uh, interventions for preparation for parenting, and we found two reviews of parental education focused interventions for expectant and new parents. Uh, these studies found small, small effects on multiple outcomes such as parenting and parental stress and moderate effectiveness of increasing maternal knowledge. However, again, the benefits to direct health outcomes for parents and newborns remained unclear. So I think this is really an area that we can improve our public health research. So I think this is my last slide, but just to summarize, overall, the Best Start prenatal key messages really do align with the new modernized OPHS in many of the topics for consideration. However, reflecting public health system role, information about the clinical practices related to labor and delivery is not included in the OPHS. And that's really the, the main difference between um, the two. So Best Start, that being said, Best Start's key messages provide a good source of detailed information in this area for parents, for public health providers and practitioners. Um, I have multiple slides of references for anyone who is interested in reading more about the studies I have referenced in this deck. Um, and thank you. Wow, thank you, Sarah. This this was just amazing. How much you packed in in 45 minutes? <laughs> I, I, and, yeah. Yes, I can and go it, fast. Yeah, and it, it's uh, helpful for people to see yeah, the links between our key messages and how they can help you support the, the public health standards. And obviously, our topics for prenatal education key messages are for everyone who deals with pregnant uh, women and families, that is why there's a lot of clinical information so that uh, f uh, family physicians, mid midwives, obstetricians, and uh, nurses can all refer to, to that information. So you can post your questions in uh, the little chat box 
And while anybody's writing their question, I, I want to emphasize that yeah, those key messages, make sure you visit the website if you have never done so. I will be sending the link when I send the evaluation link to everybody, but it's ontarioprenatal.education.ca, and we have a lot of uh, supporting evidence and all the references, and we're doing as well as we can to keep up to the information and the new guidelines that come in and making sure that these are kept up to date. And I, if you do notice something's out of date, don't hesitate to send me an email, by the way, and I do try to uh, stay up to date with it. And you can also register to get the updates for the whenever there's some more major changes that are being made. So all those key messages were part of that uh, Dr. Carsey was showing were all part of that uh, prenatal education key message for Ontario website. Now, I, I did respond, by the way, to the person who was asking about the PowerPoint presentation. So it was sent to everybody with the registration information yesterday or the connection information. And, uh, but if you didn't get it, just email me and, uh, and I will be happy to send it to you. And uh, hopefully that gives a little bit of time for people to uh, pose questions. I don't see any questions right now in the, in the box. So there, this has been recorded, and I w we will be posting a recording within 24 hours on the Best Start website. And uh, if uh, hmm, I need no questions, this was I think you said it all. <laughs> if anyone, I, I want to I want to reiterate if anyone. Um, oh, I see multiple attendees are are. Uh, writing, but if anyone has any questions for me, uh, my email address is up on that last slide, and feel free to email me directly, and I can answer as best I can uh, through email. Oh. Uh, okay, here's one question. Um, excellent webinar, thank you. Where does this leave public health units for delivering prenatal education that includes labor and birth information? Which is, yeah, one of the topics you, you mentioned just before the end there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, where there. I, I put that slide back up. So um, labor and and birth info are captured within the prenatal education materials from in within online programming and in during the classes. Um, I, as as far as I know. So that means that I wouldn't, that doesn't mean you have to take that piece out of your prenatal education classes at all. It just to do specific, uh, let's say you wanted to do a specific intervention about labor and delivery, that kind of clinical focus does not fall under the OPHS. So um, the prenatal education, because it captures all of that, and there is, of course, a piece of labor and delivery within that. Um, that falls under all prenatal education, but I just wanted to specify because Best Start has a clinical focus, as you mentioned, Louise, it is for all uh, providers of prenatal care, that um, that's just the main difference that I could find between the messages. Does that answer your question? Oh, yes, okay. okay. It's answered it. <laughs> then um, uh, 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 Kingston uh, Frontenac. Uh, has a question also, can you speak to how the Best Start messages overlap with the pregnancy counseling? And uh, I guess pre pregnancy counseling is in the growth and in the OPHS? Yeah. So yeah, pregnancy okay. counseling is a new topic for consideration that was included um, in the Healthy Growth and Development Guideline. Um, my understanding, and anyone could correct me if I'm wrong, but pregnancy counseling was really something that aligned more with the health, healthy sexuality and sexual health um, program areas or, or within public health units. I know they're all structured differently, but that really is more about how to uh, counseling women or, you know, adolescents or individuals who are pregnant and may not go through with the, with the birth. Um, and so that was really more aligned with uh, the healthy sexuality piece. I did not touch on that. Um, and I didn't uh, look into the prenatal key messages from Best Start that would align, align with that piece. I'm not sure if it does. Got it, thank you. We weren't clear what it referred to. Yes, I think a, a few of these um, 
sort of more abstract topics of consideration might become clear when we're able to show the topics, uh, the topic overviews, and we can give you a good idea of some of the keywords and searches that we used to find the evidence to support public health interventions for those topics. So that's and my understanding. Yeah, yeah, that's my yeah understanding. in the health before pregnancy key message, there is a little bit about uh, the planning aspect. So that might be a pregnancy counseling also. So because there was the question, how, where is it in the best start messages? Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. That could go under that. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, well, maybe not. But you can always email uh, later if you need to. You could email. Uh, Dr. Carthy or myself, and I'll pass on your questions. And I, as you, we close this webinar, by the way, you will be provided a link for evaluation. Evaluation is very important to us to know how we did, and, and also it, it does help our funders know if this uh, is a useful uh, venue system to provide information and uh, do the knowledge translation. I really, really want to thank Dr. Carsley. This was uh, very informative, very full of, inf of, uh, of details. All the little research details you added in there were very helpful too. So thank you very much. And uh, I think we will close this uh, webinar. Okay. Thank you very much, Louise. Take care.